So when we think about the, the Earth system and the relationship between climate and human beings and the, the biogeochemical cycles, so the life part of the Earth system, so we tend to divide, as, as sort of Earth system scientists, we tend to divide um, this whole very complicated system with all these different feedbacks into it, into the sort of physical parts of it, so the bits that are driven by um, radiation uh, and energy and mass and momentum, the, 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 the conservation of those things, those give us very hard constraints on where energy has to be and how we move it around and where mass has to be. But the, where the sort of complicated aspect, so physics enables us to explain those flows, even though they're very, very complicated and you know, we have to make many approximations. Physics and sort of physical principles enable us to build models of how to understand those processes. Where that gets more complicated is when we think about the biogeochemical cycles. And what I mean by that is the, the, the interactions between the biology, the biota, the living stuff, and uh, the geochemistry. So in particular, things like the carbon cycle. So the carbon cycle is, it has, an, it has a, 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 a direct physical component, how much carbon is there in the atmosphere, how much is stored in the oceans, how much is stored in the, the geology, in rocks, uh, and where that goes and how's it, how it moves around. So the carbon cycle, when we, uh, the, the, you know, one of the, the, the most dynamic aspects of it is the relationship between plants and the atmosphere. So that aspect is plants doing photosynthesis and absorbing uh, carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen and producing along the way, producing tissues and fruit and leaves and wood and things that we can consume as, as humans, but also the other animals. So um, all kinds of different animals from the very largest uh, grazing megafauna, elef elephants and, uh, and, and buffalo and so on, down to the very smallest, down to insects, down to even uh, um, inanimate animals, so fungi and bacteria. The relationship between the sort of fungi and bacteria and the carbon cycle is one that we've only really started to probe you know, fully over the last 20 or 30 years. We've realized how important it is. So some of the big issues that, that we have in, in studying uh, things like the, car the carbon cycle is um, where is carbon in the system? Where does it go? How does it get there? How dynamic is it? So as I said at the outset, that the sort of physical process of moving things around is, is relatively easy to model in some senses. And when you throw life into that, then it gets much more complicated. So if we think about um, the atmosphere, the ocean and the land surface, in the atmosphere we have gases moving around. So we can model that using the kind of models that, that climate scientists use for dynamics of, of gases and, and vapours. Um, if we think about the ocean, the ocean is a big liquid body, it has a huge store of energy and also a huge store of carbon. Uh, it absorbs carbon through uh, um, chemical absorption through the surface. Uh, some of that carbon is taken up by, uh, again, plant life in the, the surface part of the ocean. Some of that then falls down to the bottom of the ocean and that forms uh, carbonate deposits at the bottom of the ocean, which then tend to be locked up for geological timescales. So there's a huge amount of carbon locked up in mineral deposits at the bottom of the ocean, but the timescales of any possible turnover for that is tens to, of, of millions of years. So on human timescales, you know, beyond our um, worrying about. But of course, as you get up to shorter and shorter timescales, we move to the land surface where we have plants and animals that respire on a daily basis their input to the, to the carbon cycle is very, very dynamic and it's very patchy as well. That's another problem is that, you know, we have deserts, we have forests, we have um, huge agricultural areas, we have urban areas. So the dynamics of, the, of carbon release into the atmosphere and absorption happens on scales of seconds to minutes to hours. So if we, if we think about a forest, for example, a forest are taking up carbon all the time for photosynthesis. It's, that doesn't happen so much during the, the night, so there's a day-night cycle, then there's a seasonal cycle, uh, and then there are the much longer term changes. So there are all these different cycles of different time periods overlaid on one another. If we think about agriculture, we take a, an area of land and we plant stuff, wheat, let's say, and then that grows through the season, and then we take it all out again. 
So in terms of the, the carbon cycle, essentially that piece of land is carbon neutral uh, in as much as we planted stuff, it grew, and then we took it out, we did something with it. We harvested it, we ate it, we fed it to animals and so on. Um, but that's moving carbon around in this carbon cycle. And when you want to try and understand and model a carbon cycle, that's a very complex process. So what's happened over the last 20 or so years is a combination of understanding that the, the dynamics of, of carbon cycle is, is really quite complicated when you start to consider the, the, the biological aspect. And so there are these two directions. Uh, the kind of climate scale models started from modeling the fundamental processes of the sort of physics of the system and then realized that if you don't get the biology in there somehow, those models will be uncertain. And a large part of that uncertainty will be driven by not getting the, the living part right. At the same time, ecologists and uh, uh, biologists have been looking at how to model those processes on scales from individual cells through to leaves through to forests and then coupling those to climate. And of course, those models are operating at very different scales and for, for different purposes. And so one of the challenges that there's been over the last 20, 30 years is how to uh, mesh those two directions of science, if you like, how to put some, some biology and some ecology into climate and how climate can feed back to the ecology. Because if you want to predict what's going to happen to the land surface and the carbon cycle over the next 20, 50 or 100 years, um, there's no point in saying, well, we're just going to move carbon around without thinking about what's happening to the living part and the feedbacks. And we've started to realise that those feedbacks are extraordinarily complex, which is interesting and fascinating, but difficult. So as an example of one of the difficulties, a, um, a big part of the feedback of uh, the, the carbon cycle to the, the living uh, organisms on Earth is fire. So fire in the Earth system drives a huge amount of release of carbon from burning vegetation. Uh, it happens all over the world. It happens from northern parts of Siberia, huge fires in, in boreal forests there, through to uh, peatlands in, the, in Southeast Asia, through to the grass fires of the savannah, through to fires in, in tropical forest regions, even in rainforest regions where lots of those fires, in fact, most of the fire on Earth these days is started by humans. If you went back 500 or 1,000 years, that would not have been the case. The fires were very seasonal, driven by drought and by lightning. Those cycles are still there, but on top of that, you have the human input. So I say, in Africa, 99% of the fires are started by people, either by accident or deliberately for clearance and so on. So modelling those dynamics of, of fires and understanding how that affects the release of carbon into the atmosphere is, as you can imagine, extraordinarily complicated because people are doing it. Even when we do it planned, it's hard to incorporate that on a global scale. When we do it unplanned, which is what we do most of the time, then incorporating that into a, some kind of model that allows you to make predictions is very hard. So what, again, what has sort of changed the, the way we look at things there over the last 20 or so, 30 years, is satellite observations, which have allowed us to not necessarily say um, too much about why fires have started in, in one area rather than another, but have allowed us to look at where fires occur, when they occur, how severe they are, how large they are, and to estimate how much carbon is released from savannas, from croplands, from clearance of forest and deforestation in South America and Southeast Asia. So satellite observations give us this synoptic global overview of uh, fires, which have been a real um, change in the way that, that, that carbon cycle modelers have been able to consider uh, modeling the carbon cycle and the feedbacks to the Earth system. As I say, the, the complexities of considering this carbon cycle aspect, and I, I focus primarily on the land surface here, the ocean has a whole other set of challenges associated with it. The ocean is an easier problem in some respects because the, the dynamics tend to be horizontal and the ocean is a very large area of relatively, um, other than for things like te temperature and, and so on, yes, there are, there are differences from one place to another but it's a very big integrating area, the ocean, whereas the land surface is incredibly heterogeneous. 
it changes everywhere on all sorts of different scales. Whereas the ocean and the atmosphere are, are, are what we call a little bit more well mixed than that. They're a little bit more homogeneous. So you can apply models to those where if you assume that you understand what's going on here, that you can predict what's going on over there, those sort of things hold reasonably well. Whereas when you look at the land surface and you have forest next to agriculture and urban areas and, and managed and unmanaged and all these different heterogeneous landscapes, those kind of assumptions that what works here will work there don't hold. Uh, and so understanding how that works on a very large scale, the only way we've really been able to address that is by using satellite data. So that's where a lot of the, the advancement in carbon cycle understanding is coming from, integrating our understanding of ecology, our understanding of climate, and then using satellite observations to knit these things together.